Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. Happy Monday, everybody. Today, we are going to take a look at the sun conjoining Uranus in the sign of Taurus. We did look at this at the end of last week, prepping ourselves for today. We looked at it from the standpoint of the archetypal combination of the sun and Uranus. Uh, today, we are going to do some uh, very quick reminder horoscopes. We're going to buzz through all 12 whole sign houses and the placements of uh, the Taurus whole sign house in your birth chart. And just a quick reminder about what's getting activated in that area uh, of your life, not only today, but the rest of this week and into next week as the sun will conjoin Jupiter and Taurus. Venus will conjoin Uranus and Taurus. Uh, Venus and Jupiter will get together in Taurus. The Jupiter will be reset in its synodic cycle with the sun in Taurus. So I'm going to review all of that, give you a reminder about what events in Taurus are yet to come and uh, after we do that, I'll run through the 12 whole sign house horoscopes with some key words to help you remember. You could also go back to the May horoscopes for uh, deeper analysis with Alex and myself. Uh, but today is just a way of reminding ourselves of all of the Taurus energy to come and where exactly that lands in your birth chart by your rising sign. That's what I rec recommend you listen to. Of course, if you like your sun sign horoscope, you can listen to the sign of your sun as I run through them, whatever you prefer. Anyway, that is our agenda for today. I have some really important announcements uh, because we have some deadlines coming up this week. So I'm going to go through those too. But before I get into it, don't forget to like and subscribe, share your comments and reflections. You can find transcripts of any of my daily talks on the website, nightlightastrology.com. The first thing I have to remind you guys of is the fact that uh, this Thursday night, my next live talk on Neptune's entrance into Aries is going to happen. Now, I don't want to sound doom and gloom because I'm really not that kind of astrologer, but Neptune and Saturn getting together in those early degrees of Aries is going to be easily the biggest outer planetary configuration since Saturn and Pluto got together at the outset of the pandemic. Now, I don't say that to be like alarmist and freak everyone out, but people need to start thinking about this conjunction because this conjunction is a very significant one. Uh, anytime Saturn and an outer planet get together in a conjunction, you are talking about the seeding of a major period of uh, collective importance and personal importance. We're going to look at the archetypal signature of Neptune and Aries, which happens next year as Neptune is culminating in the final degree of Pisces right now. Now it's going to turn retrograde. We're not going to see Neptune and Aries for a year, but it's a very good time right now to start prepping ourselves for easily along with Saturn Pluto at the beginning of the decade, probably around the same or similar level of significance in the Neptune Saturn conjunction that's coming next year in terms of the historical and collective impact and the personal impact. So this is a really like for people who love astrology and like thinking about these big outer planetary cycles, this is a really, really important one to start thinking about. So this is Thursday night. There's still time to sign up. It's from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern. If you can't make it live after you register, we send you the talk. You can see in June and July, I have a couple of other talks coming up. The other deadline coming up, of course, is the early bird sale for the upcoming class, Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic. Class starts on June 16th. The early bird sale lasts until the 15th. That is this week. So if you want to register, you have until Wednesday of this week, just until Wednesday to sign up for the early bird payment, uh, which saves you significantly off the cost of the course or the early bird installment plan. You can spread the, the tuition out over 12 months, but you save at a lower cost than the normal payment plan. Those prices will be gone off the website <clears throat> after the 15th. Of course, if you are someone who could use need-based tuition, that is available all the way up until the start of class. We try to make sure that there's a tier available for people who might be hurting financially or might be on a really fixed or tight limited income. Um, if that's you, you can apply for the tuition assistance, put in the number that works within the sliding scale for you, and then we match you with a payment plan. So that's available up until the start of the program, but the normal costs, the early bird sale lasts until the 15th. So be sure to take advantage of that. If you want to learn more about the program after today's um, content is over. I have uh, tagged on a video that goes in depth about what the program uh, includes. So I hope you guys will stick around uh, for that. And I will also be uh, doing some demo work with the Horary program, which also begins in June. Early bird sale for that also ends this week. So be sure you check all of that out. And uh, yeah, any questions, email us info at nightlightastrology.com. Okay, on that note, let us take a look at all that is to come this week and next in the sign of Taurus. This is just a, like a little reminder for those of you who uh, need it. I'm sure a lot of you are already thinking about these events. 
But look, we have quite the lineup in Taurus right now. Today, the sun is just separating from Uranus in the sign of Taurus. And I want to take you forward and watch what happens uh, over the next couple of days. So first of all, we are going to see the sun get into the conjunction with, um, uh, with Jupiter, which is a Kazemi for Jupiter right here. This is Saturday, May 18th at the end of this week. And that is happening at the exact same time that Venus and Uranus are getting together. And just after Mercury has also entered the sign of Taurus this week, where as soon as it enters the sign, it will make a square to Pluto. That is happening uh, right here on May 17th. So the Friday the 17th, you've got Mercury and Taurus squaring Pluto in Aquarius. Going into Saturday, you have Venus conjoining Uranus and Taurus. And then uh, by, by Sunday, Venus will have passed over Uranus and the sun will have passed over Jupiter, making that Kazemi uh, and the reset of Jupiter's synodic cycle. And by Sunday, Mercury will be just about done with its separation from Pluto. So if you take all of that together, starting this week off on Monday, let's go back and look at this. On Monday, we have the sun and Uranus, right? And then speed it up a little bit. And by May 15th, Wednesday, we get Mercury entering Taurus. By Friday, we get Mercury in Taurus squaring Pluto in Aquarius. Then we have on Saturday, Venus conjoining Uranus in Taurus. And by Sunday, the sun will have crossed over Jupiter. Jupiter will be Kazemi. And then if you fast forward just a little bit more into next week, uh, we will have Venus and Jupiter conjoining at the final degree of Taurus by May 23rd. So you see, as you can see, there are still quite a few events in the sign of Taurus to come. Now, the major reason that we are looking at this is because on April 20th, Jupiter and Uranus got together in Taurus, which is a very significant uh, seeding moment of a new Jupiter-Uranus cycle, which takes about 14 years or so. That cycle we have talked about as a moment of opportunity, of renaissance and revolution, of awakening and expansion. It is generally thought of as a pretty benefic signature for change and growth and sort of acceleration and momentum in your life, creating breakthroughs where things have been stuck. And we've talked at length about Jupiter Uranus for months now. What I want to do today is continue that conversation by talking a little bit, reminding ourselves about what some of this these transits do in relation to that Jupiter Uranus transit, which we've already talked about, but we're going to kind of refresh on that. And then we're going to take a look at all of the 12 whole sign houses you can listen for your rising sign to get a reminder of what topics are likely to continue being activated in this next week or so. All right. So, um, first of all, when you see the sun hitting Uranus, go back last Friday, listen to the full talk on sun Uranus for an exploration of that archetypal combination. But broadly speaking, the sun the source of light, clarity, action, ambition, illumination, coming over Uranus, <clears throat> coming over that, uh, those degrees very close to the degrees where Jupiter, the degree where Jupiter and Uranus just met, reactivates that um, revolutionary seating moment and space that happened on April 20th. So essentially what we're seeing now here, it, uh, you know, less than a month later, is the sun accelerating or sort of pressing the gas pedal on the signature of the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. In order for this revolution to be complete, there is a way in which Jupiter is also going through death and rebirth right now. So it's like a whole systemic change that's happening, a whole systemic uh, reordering or revisioning that has to take place. That can mean that there is a feeling of transition in the air right now that may involve letting go of some things or some older things falling apart or dying. Um, or being surrendered or released, that would be very natural for the fact that Jupiter is combust and going through this moment of synodic reset while the sun has just gone over Jupiter. This revolution is now requiring a kind of death and rebirth phase for Jupiter and Taurus. Venus coming through uh, in support in her own sign is a very positive thing. I don't think this will be you know, super difficult for lots of people. I think it's going to feel like a very supported kind of transition and a supported carrying through of the promise of the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. Uh, Venus hitting Uranus later in the week 
uh, does almost the same thing that the sun does in the sense that it's just going to reactivate the need for that kind of change and revolution promised by Jupiter Uranus conjoining in April. Venus to Jupiter at the very end after Jupiter's reset is really sweet because it, it has that feeling of mending and starting the process of revision and reconstruction. And then they both move into Gemini where the work continues in a new sign. That's a really fascinating transition. We started talking about Jupiter and Gemini last week through a number of different videos. We're going to be talking more about the transition from Taurus to Gemini and what that transition looks like on an archetypal and sort of evolutionary level. Uh, that will be doing closer to the time of Jupiter's entrance into Gemini this month. But the fact that those two planets meet and then they shift into Gemini, both uh, co-present at the next new moon cycle in Gemini is really fascinating. Um, but the meeting of those two benefics is, of course, wonderful and also starts to bring forth some of the benefic fruits of the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction once again. So Mercury entering Taurus and also squaring Pluto in Aquarius um, continues to refine and shape the vision and plan and can modify or augment structures. You think of Aquarius and you think of the paradigmatic structures, the, the, the blueprints laid out on the table. So there's been a lot of that since we've had many planets in Taurus move through the square to Pluto in Aquarius. But this month at the at the uh, as these transits are all completing around the end of Taurus, and Mercury is also entering Taurus and then squaring Pluto. You're thinking of yourself. You're thinking to yourself, yeah. There's been quite a vision, a vision guided by Venus and Taurus, right? That's the whole, the the, the values of Taurus: beauty, sensuality, pleasure, stability, ease, peace, a kind of power and happiness combined in the material, sensual, embodied world. That's the value of, of Taurus. Um, so everything is sort of supporting the development of where we're trying to take that vision in this next week or so. Mercury squaring Pluto uh, will also complement that work by continuing to look at and maybe modify uh, plans, ideas, thoughts, and structures around the Venusian um, space. So anyway, that's just kind of an, a big overview, a quick, messy overview of all of these planets in Taurus working through so many aspects uh, in the upcoming week. Now, we are also this week going to be breaking down these aspects individually. So we will look at Venus and Uranus uh, again as the week goes on. We will look at the synodic reset of Jupiter once more. We'll look at Mercury square Pluto. So if you're craving more of an in-depth treatment on any of these combinations uh, in the air, don't worry. That's what we're planning on doing as the week goes on. What I thought would be a good thing to do to start the week is to refresh on this big picture of, that, that's of what's happening and then take a look at the whole sign houses and remind everybody of those topics being activated right now. So I am going to, uh, let me just kind of reset this here. I am going to come back. Here we go. We'll just I'm kind of fast forwarding this right now to the end of the week. This is like Friday, Saturday. But uh, either way, just so that I can get a picture of all of those Taurus planets at once on the screen. But remember, this is the, the entirety of this week and into next week that these topics I'm going to mention will be really activated. They'll be active. active. And remember also that these you should this should be like by this point pretty familiar because we've been talking about this whole sign house in horoscopes for a while now leading up to the Jupiter Uranus conjunction. Uh, so anyway, for Aries, and these are just like little quick rapid fire. For Aries, everything lands in the second house. One of the names of the second house was bios or like bios, like life. And it has to do with everything we cultivate, develop that supports our physical life whether that's your diet, your food, money, skills and resources, anything you cultivate that props up and supports your physical existence in this life, as well as even people in your life that act in that manner. Uh, for example, in Indian astrology, the second house is sometimes related to family members because they're thought of as immediate physical support in your life. But anyhow, the second house um, in this respect is about the continued opening and developing of resources, skills, abilities, things that can support you, and also, broadly speaking, income and expenditures. So you see a, a significant change with respect to what you are in possession of, what you have, what skills, resources, abilities, and assets you possess, 
and maybe also uh, expenditures that you have and the balance of energy going in and out. All right, so that's for Aries rising. That's your whole sign house of Taurus. And the second, if you're a Taurus rising, this is in your first house. So the shift that's happening is with respect to your body, your character, your identity, your health, your very sense of calling and purpose, as well as the best use or application of your time, energy, and resources on the level of you know your personal values and how they dictate what you're going to do with your life. This is sort of like an existential placement for Tauruses right now. As a Taurus rising myself, I can say that there's been so many considerable breakthroughs for me in the past year, most of the, which have had to do with a, a much greater emphasis on my physical body and health. Uh, because I, I tend to be a very heady, spiritual, intellectual type of person. This has been a real revolution for me. But you can see this happening in so many different ways in the first house. Existential, physical, energetic. What are your values? What are you doing? Who are you? How are you changing um, with respect to the freeing up of energy as well? Um, so thinking about the, the, the sense of identity and health and body going through revolution for Taurus Risings. All right, let's move into Gemini. Gemini has eas easily one of the you know, most peculiar uh, placements to describe with so, so much revolutionary force coming through the 12th house. The 12th house is a place that often remains an enigma to us. In June, I'm going to be doing a whole series on the 12th house, which I highly recommend because we're going to be talking about the unique 12th whole sign house for every rising sign and what the lessons are. But anyway... Uh, for Geminis, the embodied realm of the Taurian senses is often a problematic place. We have to get to know it. We have to seek to consciously understand it because the Gemini risings will tend to be very mercurial and a little bit more rational, mental, intellectual, uh, and strong in those areas. The sensual domain of earthy, you know, Venus and Taurus is not always, it's not always easy to understand or see or have a healthy, clear relationship with. And so for Geminis right now, that 12th house space, unconscious material with regard to pleasure, relationships, love, sexuality, the earth, the body is all calling for more attention, time, energy, and focus. And it can sometimes call for that attention or focus through the eruption of unconscious material coming into your life from other people, from yourself. But that's where the focus is at right now for Geminis. All right. So for cancers, if you're a cancer rising, this is a revolution that is opening up new possibilities in the realm of people, places, groups, uh, allies. And the future looks really bright right now for cancers because there are so many people and possibilities opening up um, in that 11th house. So whether that's just purely social groups or friends or new opportunities coming up through specific friends, or if it's professional groups or networks of people, there's a, a real way in which your life is going to look very different this year and going forward because of the new opportunities that are opening up in new communities and groups of people. Uh, that's the way that I would summarize the cancer transit. Also changes within existing groups that are very meaningful and constitute maybe new opportunities for collaboration or a shift of values with respect to who you call friends or what groups you associate or align with. Well, for Leos, <clears throat> we take this constellation of uh, planets in the sign of Taurus, and we um, we think about the career house. So the place where you are looking to achieve a certain level of notoriety, power, success, mastery, fame, rank, status, stature, position, um, calling and purpose in the sense of vocation or development of skills, abilities, and their employment in the world, in service of the world, there is such a renaissance and awakening and freeing and shifting of focus for Leos right now. And that has been the story for a while with Jupiter Uranus there. Now you're going to see a lot of that really accelerating this month. Um, and then we're going to see some transition for Leos into the Gemini placement in the 11th house. Some of this is going to start carrying over into groups of people next. For Virgos, this is taking place in the ninth house, which is the place of higher education, of religion and spirituality, of your paradigmatic, uh, um, like, excuse me, of your paradigmatic uh, systems of belief and the way that your systems of belief orient your life, whether that's, again, philosophically or religiously. It also speaks to just new opportunities around learning and studying 
traveling abroad, expanding your mind, expanding your horizons, teaching and teachers, publishing and uh, kind of considering new ideas and new horizons that open your mind and world. So that is such an emphasis for Virgos right now. And even my eight-year-old, I think this is really fascinating that, um, you know, there's even changes that are happening with her and her schooling at eight years old that reflect this. And I thought that was really interesting. And um, anyway, so watch for that area of opening the mind and intellect and spirit and kind of expanding through a change or shift in, in beliefs and and spiritual or intellectual orientation. So that's for Virgos. If we go into the whole sign house of Libra, we have another one of the somewhat more challenging or difficult placements, at least on the level of description. Like it's kind of challenging to describe a big Taurus stellium and Jupiter Uranus dynamic in the eighth. But one of the things that this speaks to is a freeing up of energy and time and money and resources with respect to soul contracts. So if you have been in relationships that have been binding and your obligations have been heavy and burdensome, you may find that certain soul contracts are ending such that you're able to be released from various forms of energetic or financial bondage. On the other hand, there could also be new contracts, soul contracts coming in that free you up by granting you new resources. It could be emotional, it could be financial, whatever kinds of resources are coming in that could grant greater freedom or movement or opportunity because new people are coming in. Or again, expiring soul contracts that free up energy. Either way, the idea is about renaissance and revolution with respect to the bonds and obligations and the reciprocal sort of dynamics, the give and take of your relationships and what they provide or what they keep you from and so on and so forth. Now, when we go to Scorpio rising, we place all of these planets into the seventh house, which is the quintessential house of love, relationships, sexuality. Also, broadly speaking, the seventh house pertains to pleasure. So there is, for Scorpios, there is a significant uh, series of events that have been happening in the seventh house with respect to love, sex, and relationships. Hopefully, they have been freeing you up. Or these, these kinds of transits can actually speak to things happening in the life of a partner. So if you're not seeing significant change in your relationship or you're not meeting new people or changing relationships and something very literal like that isn't happening, you may also find that in an existing relationship, these openings are something that are taking place with respect to your partner. They're getting a new job or they're transforming, they're doing some healing work uh, and so forth. So sometimes it's also about what's happening to the people that we are closest to in the seventh house. You could also just say that broadly speaking, the need for evolution and change in the realm of relationships is the focus for Scorpios with all of these transits. Scorpio rising, of course. Sagittarius, we take these planets into the sixth, one of, again, the more difficult placements to describe. So the reason that the sixth house is a difficult place to describe is because it represents anything that we have to fight persevere for, sacrifice for, work hard for, on behalf of success, skill development, mastery, but also it has to do with things that we have to fight and persevere to overcome, like sickness or illness, or chronic, uh, you know, difficulties, <laughs> okay, on the ongoing stub your toe house of life, but also the place where when you sacrifice and sort of burn with passion for things and you keep persisting in your efforts in time, it pays off. But it's like a kind of chop wood carry water house in that respect. So with the revolution happening here, one of the primary significations for Sages right now is about the gaining of momentum to overcome or move beyond things that have been difficult for a while. Now you're finding that you're able to move through them and you're gaining resources or help or there's sort of the wind in your sails helping you move through a period of turmoil. Or you might be seeing momentum surrounding something you've already put a lot of effort into. Now it's showing results. Or you may find that you're able to recover or um, kind of bounce back from something that's been difficult. You may also find that things, surprise challenges are popping up, but these challenges are you can see very clearly that if you handle this in the correct way, there's an incredible opportunity within the challenge. Those are the kinds of things I would look at for Sag Rising. Um, also, the, the possibility of new or innovative ways of dealing with problems, uh, that comes to mind as well. 
Now, uh, for Capricorns, we take this and we place all of the Taurus energy into the fifth house, house that was associated with pleasure, joy, creativity, children, pregnancy, romance. Um, there is a sense in which the fifth house is always asking us, yeah, but are you happy? Are you creatively fulfilled? Capricorns right now have an opportunity to make some serious uh, progress with respect to the creative, um, the, the sense of creative fulfillment. It's like, are you happy? Are, are you doing things that are creatively fulfilling? Now, for some people, that could this could translate these transits into like literally getting pregnant, but it can also mean that you're looking for more romance, more fun, more pleasure, more creative satisfaction. But there's openings here with respect to pleasure, joy, and creativity, um, and maybe the topics like children as well that I would watch for and uh, follow your bliss. That is a, an important statement that speaks to the core of the fifth house. And in Capricorns, you need to do that right now if you're not. Um, really pay attention to that. It's a, it's a part that Capricorns can spend so much time thinking, yeah, but how do I get to the top of the mountain that they don't think, well, is there an enjoyable path I can take up? If I'm going to get there either way, <laughs> maybe I can find a path that is actually pleasant and has some good sights to take in and some good spots to nap and catch a lunch and you know, you know, so anyway, anyway, um, so for Aquarians, this is all taking place in the fourth house, place of home, family, roots, ancestry, also a place that was associated with the mysteries. I wonder about feminine, pagan, earthy, sensual, um, you know, mystery experiences, initiations into uh, the, the sort of the pagan mysticism of Taurus in the fourth house, the sensual embodied realm that's not always easy for Aquarius rising to access. What's opening up around those spaces? That's an interesting question. Another one would be, you know, what is changing with respect to like literally your living environment, uh, moving, relocating, remodeling, uh, redesigning, redecorating, or rearranging furniture? All of that comes to mind as well as, you know, significant breakthroughs around the topics of home and family or ancestral karma in general. Now, with Pisces rising, the last of our 12 signs, we take all of this and place it into the third, a place that is also difficult to describe. Uh, the third house is difficult to describe because it is, uh, you guys have heard me say this a million times before. If you're a Pisces, you're probably sick of hearing me say this. It is like the, the aquarium. You know, the fish has a little house under the rock, but the rest of the aquarium is the environment that defines the fish's life. And so the third house has this very nebulous meaning of the psychic, cultural, emotional, mental, karmic environment of the lifetime. It was called the joy of the moon and the moon was the ruler of the karmic environment of the life. So this is why we say brothers and sisters, neighborhood, local environment, right? All of that kind of stuff. Um, and when you have planets like this in Taurus in the third house, first of all, the, the major thing is asking the question, what in the environment brings me happiness? What brings chaos? What brings discord versus peace? What brings sensual uh, happiness and fulfillment? And how can I shift or change something of the karmic culture of my life so that it is reflective of these values and needs that I have as a soul to have embodied, stable, sensual, peaceful um, experience? So looking for revolution in the name of those things on the level of the environment, which also in the third house could include the body and mind and meaningful shifts that you need to make in terms of your own mental and psychological makeup. So those are the things to watch for if you are a Pisces rising. Okay, well, we ran through it there. I hope that that was useful. Just give you a quick little refresher on the topics of the whole sign house of Taurus according to your rising sign. These are whole sign houses, right? So ancient astrologers used whole sign houses, horoscopes, all kinds. Of, and no matter what kind of horoscope you're doing, it, it will involve whole sign houses. So that's why I recommend listening to your rising sign. You'll get the transits according to the whole sign position of your birth chart, which is the most accurate. So uh, if you if you um, listen to your sun sign, of course, that's fine too. I recommend listening to your rising as well. Uh, but anyhow, that's it for today. I hope that you found this useful. We will be back to talk about some of these transits in depth, Venus uh, and Uranus coming up and Sun's synodic reset with Jupiter. Lots to get into this week, so I look forward to it. Stick around after I sign off to learn more about the upcoming first year program. There is a promo video that I've tagged on after I am done today. And then um, don't forget that this Thursday night, the Neptune in Aries webinar is taking place. I think you guys will really like that. It is a huge transit Saturn and Neptune in Aries next year that we need to start thinking about in terms of what 
the Neptune and Aries significations are going to be about and so forth. So check that out. I hope to see you guys there and we will see you again tomorrow. Bye everyone. Hey everyone, thanks for sticking around. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our upcoming program, Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic, my year one course in ancient Hellenistic astrology that begins on June 16th. If you'd like to learn more about it, of course, you can always do some digging and looking at the course page on your own. I'll take you over there right now and walk you through it. But if you want to, you can go over yourself and look. Nightlightastrology.com is the website. Click on the courses tab and go to the first year course. This is the one that begins on June 16th, the perfect place to start for people who would like to learn more about natal astrology from the Hellenistic point of view. So this is a one-year course in Hellenistic astrology, which is the oldest form of astrology, and it is the form from which all subsequent forms of astrology come from. It shares a lot in its roots with ancient Indian astrology. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what characterizes Hellenistic astrology, but just to familiarize you with this page, when you go to the first year course page and scroll down, you can learn more about everything that's included in the course. Um, some of the main features include 30 classes on the year. Uh, these classes are spread out through uh, units of curriculum. And in between the major units of curriculum, we have breakout study sessions led by our tutoring staff. We also have an interactive group forum discussion that is staffed with tutors year round. You always get your questions answered within 24 hours. So there's a lot of support built into the program as we work our way through the curriculum. We also have uh, recommended reading, listening, optional quizzes, flashcards, bonus lectures, uh, more than you could possibly read in a year, honestly. So we just have a, lar a large and long biography and sort of library of suggested bonus content that will fill in blanks and also uh, supplement and deepen the, the material that we are studying. Uh, you get lifetime access to all the recordings. If you cannot attend the webinars live, they meet on the weekends, but if you can't attend them live, then you are welcome to follow along with the recordings which are made available to you on the class website. So this class meets on Sundays from noon central to 2 p.m. central or 1 eastern to 3 p.m. eastern time. Um, and you might translate that, I guess, if you're on the West Coast, it would be what, uh, 10 a.m. to noon uh, Pacific time. During the program, um, in addition to working our way through all of the um, major curriculum, the major foundational elements of Hellenistic astrology, we place a strong emphasis on preparing ourselves to read charts for other people. Whether this is a hobby for you or something that you are um, endeavoring to practice professionally, uh, the course is built for people who are really there for a lot of different reasons. This is your hobby. This is your passion. You hope to do this for really no one other than yourself or maybe friends or family or someone who really decides they want to start a practice. You can take this class at whatever level of interest or depth that you want because of the amount of material that we make available to you inside and outside of class. You always have access to the program too, so you can always you know, take it at your own pace. You can attend live, follow along with the recordings, some combination of both. And then the breakout study sessions are really helpful uh, in addition to our interactive group forum discussion. You can always ask us questions. You can email me anytime with questions. So we have uh, a lot of support in place. Now, the curriculum, we move through the foundational elements of ancient astrology. You may look at the curriculum and say, well, I know something about these things already, but not not really, not unless you've studied Hellenistic astrology, because the way that ancient astrologers talked about houses, signs, planets, aspects, essential dignities, uh, chart delineation is radically different from what most people learn when they start studying modern astrology. The reason for that is that it's only been in the past couple of decades that we have finally had access to the vast majority of ancient texts on Hellenistic astrology. We were literally missing the bulk of our uh, ancient tradition. So the, the, the kind of rebirth or reawakening of ancient astrology is really new, which makes this very exciting because everything you've learned in modern astrology is probably coming from the lens of what is called psychological astrology, which is a way of looking at the birth chart in terms of the planet signs, houses, and the way in which they may relate to your psychological makeup or profile. In this way, birth charts are a little bit like a, you know an elaborate Myers-Briggs. So you have a uh, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the personality profiling, which is uh, the way that most people look at planets, houses, and signs that you'll notice a, my Mars, my Venus, and they, they, they think of them as aspects or dimensions of your character and personality. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we utilize, uh, much of the same, 
uh, language. And we certainly have that approach available to us in this program because ancient astrologers also looked at the chart in terms of psychological makeup. However, one of the main distinctions between modern astrology and ancient astrology is the emphasis that ancient astrologers placed on prediction. Um, they looked at the chart in terms of a field of karma that defines the, the native or the individual's um, uh, fate or destiny. And so we look at houses, signs, planets, aspects as a way of understanding what patterns, themes, and topics are going to be most prevalent and at what times, because they also had a very elaborate system of timing techniques. Now, the year one program is all about learning to read the birth chart and understanding the ancient hermetic uh, sort of Platonic Pythagorean philosophy that was behind the establishment of all of the doctrines and teachings of astrology itself. So it's really about understanding where everything comes from. It's the why behind everything that greatly empowers people when they're learning astrology. It is not nearly the same uh, when you just study lists of adjectives and descriptions for houses, signs, planets, aspects. We want to understand why. Why do we do these things at all? Where did it all come from? And when you understand that, then you have something like a skeleton key by means of which you can access your own creativity, your own intuition, rather than being told, just play these notes in this order and it will sound good. You're learning to improvise, um, which, you know, could anyone ever want to play? Why would you want to play an instrument if someone told you, well, here's the, here's how to play, play this, play this, play that. And you never learned how to play something of your own, or you never learned how to use the scales in ways that were magical and, uh, you know, pertain to your own, your own genie, your own genius. So, when we study ancient astrology, one of the main things we're doing is we're taking people beyond anything that they think they've learned about houses, signs, planets, aspects, and we're teaching them where it all came from. And once you have that, then you're really cooking with um, you're really cooking with fire. You have a, a magical, intuitive capacity that is very rare and precious in astrology. So anyway, we mo we move through a lot of different elements, but not in the way that you've ever learned them before. And that's a really important distinction. So anyway, after all of that has been said, in each unit, we, you know, we spend, you know, maybe up to 10 hours on houses. And then we have a breakout study session. And then we have reading and bonus material. So when we talk about houses in this class, you are learning where the concept of a house ever came from in the first place, what it is, how it works, and how it's different from a sign. Uh, there's you're also going to unlearn and break a lot of bad habits because not by any um intentional ignorance but modern astrology being bereft of its ancient textual tradition uh is teaching has been teaching a lot of things that are just not in line with where the actual um the actual theoretical foundations of astrology come from so you're also going to break some bad habits which is really good for people who maybe know a little bit about astrology already but are seeking to clarify and understand um theory in the context of the 2000 year history of astrology. So anyway, this is this class is going to prepare you to read birth charts for other people. But then uh, by the end, one of the great things about the program is that the way we do that is not just by pumping you full of um, theory and history and philosophy. Uh, we are also in the last portion of the program inviting live clients into the class. And that's great because when we have live clients come in, you're going to see me read from them using the theory and techniques that we've been studying. And you're going to see how they can apply, be applied artfully, as well as, um, you know, giving you some tools and methods and techniques to use uh, to set you up for success. Seeing live astrology practice while studying it is the best way to learn. So the last portion of the program, we turn toward that hands-on approach. Anyway, so that's a bit about the program. If you have any questions you want to ask, email us info at nightlightastrology.com. We're happy to answer any questions you have whatsoever. I also want to point people to the payment options at the bottom. Early bird payment saves you $500 off. That is a great way to save um, the payment plan is breaking the tuition into 12 monthly installments. If that works better for you, no worries, you can do that. And then need-based tuition. We, for you know, many, many years now, dating back to 2010 when I started teaching astrology, I've always had some kind of sliding scale option available for people when studying astrology. Uh, sacred science like this should be accessible to people of all different socioeconomic backgrounds. So we pride ourselves on making sure that there is tuition assistance available so that if your budget doesn't match with the payment price that we ask for, and that's an honest assessment that we trust you to make, that you can take advantage of the tuition assistance and set your price within a sliding scale that we provide for your monthly tuition uh, for 12 months through the program. So please feel free to apply for that if it makes sense to you. We don't want people hurting themselves or overextending themselves. A, a, a price that fits your budget is available through the need-based tuition. We just ask that you apply early because we do fill up sometimes. So 
Anyway, that is it. I hope that you will consider studying with us and thanks for taking time to learn more about the program. See you later.